Let us now examine the critical aspects of the poem The Soldier by Rupert Brooke which is prescribed for the students of BA Part 3 English Literature Paper 1. The poem is The Soldier. The Themes the theme of war, patriotism and nationhood. The soldier explores the bond between a patriotic British soldier and his homeland. Through this soldier's passionate discussion of his relationship to England, the poem implies that people are formed by their home environment and culture and that their country is something worth defending with their life. Indeed, the soldier sees himself as owning his own identity and happiness to England and accordingly is willing to sacrifice his life for the greater good of his nation. This is then a deeply patriotic poem, implicitly arguing that nations have their own specific character and values and that England's are specially worthy of praise. Though most people might fear death, particularly of the violent kind that war can bring, the speaker of the soldier is prepared to die because he believes he would be doing it for his beloved homeland. The speaker thus doesn't want, to pe want people to grieve his death. He sees that potential death in some foreign field, notably foreign because it wasn't it won't be in England, as a way of making a small piece of the world forever England. That is because he, seems, he sees himself as an embodiment of his nation. Accordingly, dying somewhere foreign leaves a small part of the home nation in that foreign land. Nationhood then is portrayed as something that is inseparable from a person's identity, even when they die. Indeed, the speaker feels he owes his identity itself primarily to his country. It was the personified England that bore, means gave birth, and shaped him, nourish, nourished him with sun, ironic given the often gloomy weather of England, and air and cleansed him with water. Much of the sonnet's octave, the eight-line stanza, is devoted to creating a sense of England as a pastoral, idyllic, and even Eden-like place. The poem's imagery of rivers, flowers, earth, air, and sun is part of an attempt to transform nationhood from a human concept to something more fundamental and natural, all the while tied to England specifically, as though the land is infused, means filled with the character of its people and vice versa, that is the other way around. In fact, this nationhood is so deeply embedded in who people are, or so the poem argues, that it extends beyond the earthly realm. Even the heaven that the speaker hopes to go to is specifically an English heaven. In part, that is because the speaker's idea of heaven is a projection of how he sees England, apart from being a kind of natural and nurturing mother, England is already a kind of heaven. Indeed, the poem presents England and heaven as almost interchangeable. As described above, everything about England is supposedly pure and nourishing. The speaker's consciousness after he dies will return to an eternal mind which will still be forever linked to the place that created it. There is nothing in the poem then of the horrors of war. Indeed, there is very little of the realities of war at all. 
this perhaps explains the why the poem has inspired strong reactions ever since its publication. It was immensely popular when it was published in 1914. But this was before the true horror, horrors of First World War had been fully revealed. A time when the war was still tinged, means mixed with an air of excitement, anticipation and of course patriotism. In the decades that followed, some critics saw Brooks' poetry as woefully naive and sentimental. Naive means childish not very mature. Either way, the poem is a powerful expression of patriotic desire and belief in the bond between people and their homeland. The Soldier, Poetic Devices and Figurative Language First, Alliteration. Alliteration is a figure of speech in which the same sound repeats in a group of words such as the B sound in Bob brought the box of bricks to the basement. The repeating sound must occur either in the first letter of each word or in the stressed syllables of those words. The soldier is full of alliteration. Overall, this is a very pretty sounding and lyrical poem. The speaker presents a vision of war and death that is completely relived, relieved by the bond he feels with his home country. The sound of the poem is suitably pleasant. That is, the sounds ring together in a way that is pleasing on the ear, avoiding any harshness that might suggest anything negative. The alliteration is an important part of this overall approach. Appropriately enough, alliteration is first used from the very beginning. Across lines 1 to 3, the poem uses TH and F sounds. If I should die, think only this of me, that there is some corner of a foreign field, that is, for ever England. These sounds don't really convey anything in particular other than contributing to the overall pleasantness described in the paragraph above. Additionally, although it is not strictly alliterative, the repeating letter E in the phrase Forever England chimes with the sentence's musicality. Additionally, the two F sounds create a pair that contrasts with Ever England setting up the opposition between the foreign land and the home nation. Next in line 4, rich alliterates with richer. The line itself becomes rich in the R sound, thus adding to the poem's abundance of musicality. Lines 7, seven to 8 are full of B alliteration. These lines paint a pastoral and idyllic picture of England, which ultimately makes the country sound like Eden. Eden, this is the Garden of Eden. I have talked about it in my earlier classes, so you know what it is. The repeated sounds have a pretty and luxurious effect. A body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by the sons of home. Line 12 uses H and S alliteration. Her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day. The H sounds give the line an impassioned, breathless quality, while the S contributes to the overall prettiness of the poem. The I alliteration of the following line, I'm sorry, the L alliteration of the following line, laughter, learnt of friends, works in a similar way. This is just an example. So throughout the poem, alliteration adds to the lyrical richness of the poem, which captures the speaker's intense patriotic love for England. The next device is metaphor. The soldier is a highly figurative poem with a grand sounding rhetorical tone. Accordingly, metaphor flows throughout the poem from start to finish. 
that said most of the poem uses a specific type of metaphor known as personification the speaker's beloved england is presented as a kind of nurturing mother and mother nature figure this aspect of the poem is discussed in the personification entry of this guide there is another metaphor in work at work in lines 3 and 4 the speaker imagines his dead body slain in battle means killed in battle enriching the surrounding earth with a richer dust this metaphor compares englishness to a precious material <coughs> excuse me <coughs> that the speaker imagines will be absorbed by the foreign field ultimately making the field somehow more spiritually valuable too in lines 10 11 <clears throat> the speaker also has a metaphorical conception of what will happen to his consciousness after he dies he believes that he will exist only as a pulse in the eternal mind returning all his thoughts to england <clears throat> all his thoughts of england to the english heaven that they come from in other words the speaker compares heaven to an eternal mind and his own soul to a pulse in that mind this can also be interpreted as the speaker's actual belief that is the speaker may really believe that the world is watched over by an immortal consciousness such as god that the speaker shall return to when he dies either way this moment adds to the lyrical richness of the speaker's patriotic interpretation of his own death personification personification is an important part of the soldier it establishes the relationship between the speaker and england that is at the center of the poem personification is part of the way that the poem presents its key subject that is england the speaker always refers to england through female pronouns which contrasts with the fact that the first world war was fought predominantly by young men furthermore the speaker presents his home nation as a kind of mother figure in lines 5 and 6 the speaker relays how england bore means gave birth to him shaped him and made him conscious so england is not only a nurturing mother figure there is also something godlike about her in fact England's behavior is not far removed from God's at the beginning of the Bible. Like God, England creates a paradise in which people are granted the freedom to live as they like. That is, England creates a kind of Eden with its for its inhabitants. The speaker essentially says that he owes his entire existence to England. which is why he seems a he seems at peace with sacrificing that same existence for his country in the second stanza england is also characterized as a conscious being again this draws on godlike attributes england's an eternal mind without evil here though the personification of england focuses on its abstract characteristics its thoughts and dreams this stanza depicts england not just as a physical place but also as a spiritual state of being just as people have both bodies and minds so does england have both a landscape and an eternal mind the soldier vocabulary that is words which are used with their meanings i will not read out the meanings you can look at them i will just give you the list of words bore made aware roam blessed shed etc these words 
in the bold R in the text. Form, meter and rhyme scheme of the soldier. First, the form. The soldier borrows both from the Shakespearean and the Petrarchan versions of the sonnet. The first stanza follows the rhyme scheme of a Shakespearean sonnet, while the second follows that of the Petrarchan sonnet. Structurally, however, the poem more closely adheres to the Petrarchan sonnet overall, which is divided into an octave, an eight-line stanza, and a sestet, a six-line stanza. The poem makes the argument that when the speaker dies, he should be remembered in a particular way, without sadness and with a deep sense of patriotism. The poem introduces this concept in the first three and a half lines and then sets about providing evidence to justify it. It provides a rich series of examples to illustrate why death for England is glorious rather than sad. One of the signature elements of a sonnet is a turn or a volta. If you remember children, I had told you that at in a Petrarchan sonnet, the thought changes are at line 9. That point in the sonnet is known as a volta. This is when the poem shifts the direction of its argument. And in Petrarchan sonnets, it usually happens at the start of the sestet, which is at line 9. The volta in this poem is subtle. Means it's not obvious. After all... The speaker's passion for England rises continuously throughout the poem. But there is a difference between the two stanzas. The first is based in physical reality, while the second is about the speaker's soul and the afterlife. However, the poem ends pretty much as it had been throughout, with an appeal to the heavenliness of England. The Meter the soldier is written in formal metrical verse. As is typical of sonnets in the English language, Brooke employs iambic pentameter, lines of five feet with an unstressed, stressed, da, dum syllable pattern throughout the poem. The rhyme scheme. The soldier has a regular rhyme scheme that borrows from two different sonnet traditions using a Shakespearean rhyme scheme in the octave, that is the first eight lines, and a Petrarchan rhyme scheme in the sestet, that is the final six. The octave is rhymed A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. This is a Shakespearean rhyme scheme. Shakespeare rhymes all his sonnets in this manner. The rhymes all sound loud and clear. And this neatness is part of the poem's generally formal and stately sounding rhetoric. The poem is an idealized poem. It does not discuss the grim realities of warfare. And accordingly, the rhymes represent a kind of idyllic perfection too. The sestet is rhymed A, B, C, A, B, C. Note that this stanza uses different rhymes from the first stanza. This is the rhyme scheme Petrarch uses in his sonnets. The most significant aspect here is the way that the poem ends on a perfectly soft sounding rhyme, given and heaven. This is a feminine rhyme, meaning the word features a rhymed stress syllable followed by a rhymed unstressed syllable given and heaven. This rhyme has a gentleness to it, which is also one of the end words, representing the speaker's idea of England as a kind of heavenly paradise free from evil. This final rhyme is also a subtle example of slant rhyme. Yet the two sounds are so similar that the rhyme comes off more as an elegant pairing than a jarring moment of dissonance. And because the rhyme between given and heaven is a fairly complex one, it suggests the deliberateness with which the speaker chooses the poem's final word. The Soldier Speaker 
The speaker in this poem is, of course, the soldier of the title. The reader learns nothing specific about the soldier's circumstances. And that is because this soldier is a kind of idealized figure who represents an equally idealized way of considering nationhood and patriotism. The speaker feels himself in every fiber of his being to be an Englishman. He considers himself a son of England and England is personified as a kind of nurturing mother, mother nature figure throughout. The speaker thus buys into a traditionally patriotic view of England, one specially tied to the pastoral beauty of its green and pleasant land. An oft-quoted description of England from the hymn Jerusalem with words from a poem by William Blake. This relationship <coughs> is ex most explored in the first stanza with its mentions of dust, flowers, air, rivers and suns. These words are taken from the text. The speaker is content with the idea of his death, even embracing it. That is because he feels that dying is a noble sacrifice. Part of his way of returning the love that his country has showed him. Indeed, the speaker sees England not just as a nurturing figure, but also as a kind of heaven itself, linking his spiritual nourishment in this life and what follows to his homeland. Accordingly, he sees his eternity as one spent in an English heaven. The setting of the poem. The setting of this poem can fairly be described as the speaker's idea of England. He sees himself in both body and mind, as an extension of England. If he is to die during the war then, a small part of England will enrich the soil wherever he dies. The rest of the first stanza discusses his beloved England, portraying it as a pastoral paradise, saying little of the rain that often falls there. Instead, England is like Eden, a kind of rich and beautiful garden full of flowers, fresh air, flowing rivers and sunshine. This sets up the way that the second stanza explicitly explains England to heaven itself. Hearts at peace under an English heaven. This is the last line of the poem. Indeed, heaven and England are practically and interchangeable practically interchangeable in the speaker's mind. Now the literary and historical context. The literary context. Rupert Brooke was an English poet who lived in a, from 1887 to 1915. He wrote poetry from an early age and attended Cambridge University. He joined the English Navy during the first year of the First World War in 1914. However, he died the following year, not in warfare, as the patriotic tone of the poem might lead the leader to believe, but from poisoning brought on by an insect bite. Brooks' poetry was immensely popular from its first publication, capturing the nervous excitement of a nation at war. Though Brooke did serve in the Navy, he never saw active conflict in the First World War, perhaps explaining why the soldier is a romantic and idealized take on war and nationhood. These traits, means a quality, etc., to help to explain Brooks' poem's initial popularity. Indeed, Winston Churchill, who was Prime Minister during the Second World War, described Book Brook as an all that one could wish England's noblest sons to be. In other words, Brooks' poetry came to exemplify the patriotic soldier, willing to lay his life on the line for the greater good of his country. Of course, this intensely patriotic and idealized look at the relationship between a soldier, his home country and war, 
tells the reader little of the horrific realities of the conflict in which millions were killed. To use a biblical analogy, means comparison, Brooks' poem pictures a kind of Eden, one where horror and suffering don't exist. There is another overlapping element of the poem's literary context that is important here too. This is about the English, about how the English relate to their own country and particularly how English writers have idealized England. This poem seems to subscribe to the idea of England as an idyllic and holy, green and pleasant land. This is again a quote from William Blake's Jerusalem. The poem could be forgiven, sorry, the reader could be forgiven for thinking that England is full of sunshine and fresh air. Brooks' poem depicts England as a holy place and essentially a force for go- good in the world. The historical context. At the time, World War I was described with the term the war to end all wars, a phrase that of course turned out to be tragically inaccurate with the onset of World War II. Around 16 million people died directly in World War I, with many more perishing in the great flu outbreaks and genocides, for example, the Armenian genocide that followed. As described in the poem, World War I was a horrendously destructive war. This is the reality. Life in the trenches of Europe was terrifying and deadly and the poor conditions caused frequent sickness and disease. But Brooke didn't see any of that, dying in an unrelated incident early on into this conflict. Accordingly, this preserved him as a kind of mythic figure, a reputation also enabled by his handsome looks and his patriotic sensibilities. So, this was about the poem The Soldier by Rupert Brooke, which has been prescribed for the students of BA Part 3, English Literature in Paper 1. Thank you.